Hello everyone and welcome to another video in the Sewing Through the Decades series. Today I shall be taking on the 1970s with this delightful Empire Wasted style pattern. I can't find out much about the brand style, but I thought this pattern, which is number 4528, was perfect for representing the 70s and had the possibility of being a pretty cute dress too. This pattern recommends cotton, rayon, crepe, silk, linen, jersey, and synthetics, so most fabrics, but I opted for a vibrantly printed rayon, which also represents the 70s quite well, at least in my eyes. This pattern consists of nine pieces, and I'm making version one with the long sleeves. My mock-up for this dress fit really nicely, aside from the sleeve length, they were too short, and I was worried the dress in general would be too short, so I added length to both of those areas. I'm also assembling this with French seams since I'd like to wear the dress after completing it, and this will increase its lifetime and prevent fraying, so I'm adding half an inch of seam allowance to the necessary edges. With everything cut, it was time for step one, which is stay stitching piece A. And I despise it when patterns refer to pieces by piece number or letters instead of what the piece's function and placement is, but other than that, these instructions were great, so I'm trying not to be too annoyed by that. To stay stitch, I'm just stitching by machine around the neckline of the back piece to prevent warping. And step two is making darts and pressing them towards the center. And that's literally all they say. Make darts. Press towards center. Wildly different than the wordy instructions for the 40s and even the 60s. So I'm not sure if this is an era thing so much as a brand thing, but it's definitely different. Anyway, I'm using a fabric marker to transfer the dart placement onto my fabric and a straight edge to connect them. Then I'm pinning the darts. The darts were sewn, then ironed as they instructed, and there are two darts in each piece, one at the shoulder and one at the waist. The next step is stitching the back bodice pieces to the skirt, matching the centers. I'm not sure where the centers were exactly, so I just matched the notches instead. And I sewed this with a normal 5 eighths of an inch allowance, but stitched the seam again one quarter inch away from my first line of stitching to help prevent fraying past that point. The next step is stitching the center back seam to notch. The majority of the seam is left open for a zipper, and I accidentally left room for a French seam at this edge, but inserting a zipper into a seam partially sewn that way is rough, so I just sewed it with a one inch allowance instead. Then the seam allowance is pressed under and the closed zipper is pinned under the opening edges with tab end one inch below upper edge, having opening edges meet at center of zipper. Those are their words, not mine. And my zipper was too short, so you can see me struggling to pin it and ease the fabric to fit the length before I gave up and found a longer zipper, which is what I'm sewing in place in this footage. And they simply say stitch using a zipper foot, which I did. And yes, that is a zipper foot. Industrial zipper feet look funny. And that finishes up the back panels. For the front panels, the first step is stay stitching around the neckline of C and D also known as the front panels. Then it wants me to make the pleats in the bottom edge, and the instructions for this are to make pleats on outside, fold along solid lines, bring folds to broken lines, baste. So I'm first transferring those lines onto the fabric. As a side note, when I first bought this pattern, I thought it was constructed with tucks instead of pleats, and I was dreading sewing dozens of tucks into a rayon. I was beyond thrilled when I opened it up and realized it was pleated instead. Pleats are much, much easier. And after these were pleated, I stitched across the pleats by machine to temporarily hold them in place. Temporarily is until they're sewn onto the skirt pieces. After they're stitched by machine, the pleats really aren't going anywhere. Anyway, now the center front seam and the skirt can be sewn, or as they say, stitch center front seam to medium dot, clip curves. And I'm sewing this as a French seam, so it's stitched with the wrong sides facing each other first. Then the seam allowance is trimmed, it's ironed flat, and folded on the seam line with the right sides facing each other. Then sewn again, so all the raw edges are neatly tucked away. You'll see me do this several times throughout the duration of this video, but that is the only time I'm going to explain it. 
Just like with the back panels, now the bodice is pinned to the skirt with the centers matching. They wanted you to base this before stitching, but I decided that pins were good enough. And like with the back panel, I'm sewing another line of stitching one quarter inch away from the first to help prevent fraying. That seam is ironed down, as they instructed, and now the shoulder seams can be stitched. Again, that's all they said. Stitch shoulder seams, matching small dots. Pretty simple and to the point. And I'm sewing these as French seams as well. And now you're probably thinking it's time to sew up the side seams, or time for the pattern to tell me to do that and for me to ignore them. But no, this pattern gets a gold star from me since their side seams aren't done up until after adding the collar and yoke. This is the superior method, so good job style. I guess you could say that I like their style. Now onto the collar. I went rogue with this first step and decided to interface one side of the collar pieces. If I was using a cotton or linen, I probably wouldn't have bothered, but rayon has no structural integrity at all, so it needs interfacing as a helper. And now I shall follow their instructions. With the right sides together, stitch upper and under collar sections together, matching centers. Trim corners, trim seam, clip curves, turn collars, press, baste raw edges together. Let's just go one step at a time with that. So these were pinned and sewn together with the long edge left open since it will attach to the neckline and be covered by a facing. Also, the sides of the collar are assembled separately since the center back has a zipper that requires it to be broken up. Then I clipped the corners and trimmed the seam allowance to one quarter of an inch. I ironed all the seam allowance open and used my tailor's board to get the lines of the collar really sharp. And after a few minutes of fiddling with that, the collar was ironed flat with the edges even. And I didn't think basting was super necessary since this was so firmly pressed. However, I did follow the next step, which is pinning and basting the collar pieces to the neckline. And basting is just a loose temporary stitch to secure pieces prior to them being properly sewn. But usually actually sewing them on is faster, which is why I rarely do it unless I'm working with a really tricky fabric. Now onto unit four, the facing and side seams. Step one is stitching the shoulder seams of the facings, then stitching under one quarter inch on long, a notched edge. I actually used that edge inward with an iron first to make the curve a little cleaner, then I sewed it. And again, I have to praise the pattern's logic for properly finishing the edge of a facing before sewing it on. The next step, with right sides together, pin facing to neck edge, matching centers and small dots. Baste. Be careful not to catch in bodice seams. Stitch neck edge, break stitching at medium dot, clip front facing to medium dot, trim seam, clip curves. I already met my basting quota for this project, so I pinned and sewed the facing on normally. And I think their references to the medium dots refer to the center front and center back portions of the collar, which is where the stitching begins, pivots, and ends. But I don't think their phrasing makes that very clear. I notched the seam allowance, then folded the facing inward and pinned it down. They specified a slip stitch center back edges and catch stitch facing in place. I'm assuming they mean a catch stitch, which is also sometimes called a cross stitch, so that's what I did. And they didn't say whether to just stitch it at the seams or all the way around. But since we seem to be on the same wavelength here, I went with my preference, which is sewing the entire facing down. And now, after all the tricky stuff is done, the side seams can be sewn. And I did these as French seams, of course. Unfortunately, it is now time for sleeves. I started by transferring all the markings onto my fabric, of which there were many. There were dozens, in fact, since the top and bottom edges of the sleeves are fully pleated. But that's okay, it could be worse. It could be tucks. 
third step of the sleeves is actually making a facing. They don't specify the dimensions for this, but they call it a strip, which makes me think it's about two inches wide. And they want you to turn the edges inward by a quarter inch and sew them down, which I did. Now what did we do with this facing strip? Let's listen. With the right sides together, pin center a facing strip to slash from lower edge to small dot, baste. Stitch one quarter inch from basting at lower edge, tapering to point at top of basting, slash between stitching. Instead of using basting as a guideline, I just marked the line onto my fabric, then sewed around it. And after doing that and clipping it, I used my iron to turn the facing inward to get a really nice and smooth finish. And I decided to stitch the edges of the strip facing down, though they don't mention that within the pattern. I think they expect you to, otherwise it would get in the way of the pleats. Though now that I reread it, they instruct you to fold the facing inward after pleating, so who knows what they meant for you to do. My way worked just fine. Now for more pleating instructions! Or the exact same pleating instructions as before, just repeated. So pretty much par for the course with my videos. To make pleats on outside, fold along solid lines, bring folds to broken lines, baste, be careful not to catch and facing. And this is repeated for both the top and the bottom of the sleeves. And on both sleeves, obviously, unless you want to make a strange asymmetrical sleeve statement. And once again, I'm basting the pleats as they instruct, I'm just doing it by machine instead of by hand. Machine pasting is definitely a thing. No, really, it actually is, though that's probably not what they meant in this case. And now the side seam for the sleeves can be done up, and I did this with a French seam as well. Now for the cuffs. They say, fold cuff along fold line with right sides together. Stitch ends to seam line, continuing to small dot to form lap. Clip to small dot, trim corners, trim seams. They are so obsessed with dots on this one, but I guess it worked out okay. The cuffs were sewn, trimmed, turned, and ironed as they instructed. Now, with the right sides together, pin sleeve to cuff, placing underarm seam at medium dot. Baste, stitch, trim seam, press seam towards cuff, turn under 5 eighths of an inch on raw edge of cuff, slip stitch in place. So the key to this is just stitching on one side of the cuff to the right side of the fabric. The other edge will fold over the raw edges and be stitched down by hand. They make this pretty clear with the diagrams, but not so much with the instructions. And my lighting was awful here, but you can see me pinning and whip stitching the inner edge of the cuff down. And after this, I did a fitting to find out the button placement on the cuffs, only to realize the cuffs were large enough that they didn't need closures. So instead of faffing around with buttonholes, I lapped the cuffs and stitched the buttons on directly. And see if you can catch the exact moment I put my blinds down. I have overhead lights now, so I can do that when it gets too sunny and continue filming. It's fantastic! So the next step is inserting the sleeves. They say, with right sides together, pin sleeve to armhole edge with center small dot at shoulder seam, match remaining small dots, match underarm seam, pull machine stitchings to fit, baste easing in fullness, stitch. Stitch 1 8 of an inch away from first stitching, trim seam close to stitching, press seam towards sleeve shrinking out fullness. I think there are more words in that paragraph than there are in the rest of the instructions, like the entirety of the rest of the instructions. But I guess that's okay. However, I didn't find basting necessary or gathering the top edge with machine stitching, since it fit the arm side just fine. So I matched up the precious dots and seams, then sewed it on. 
I also followed their step of doing two lines of stitching and trimming the seam allowance before ironing. Now onto the hem. Since I was working with Rayon, my hem warped a lot, and I expected this, so I let it hang on my dress form for a couple days, then trimmed the hem to be level. And just shorter in general, since it turns out the extra inch I added wasn't necessary. Their first hemming step is marking the hem and easing fullness with an iron, but again, I didn't find that necessary for this fabric in particular skirt. So I skipped to stitch one edge of seam binding one quarter inch over raw edge and slip stitch in place. Again, I'm using vintage binding from my stash, which is probably from the 70s. This is just top stitched on from the right side of the fabric. And after sewing this on, I used my iron to ease the fullness from the hem and to make sure I had an even one inch hem. Then this could be slip stitched down by hand, which I also did. And the dress is done, and it's really cute. I don't think this fabric does it a lot of favors, and I think a quilting cotton or something that holds its shape better would be more flattering and support the bell shape shown on the pattern envelope. But it's still quite cute and fits me quite well. I definitely consider making this again from a different fabric and following more style patterns. I appreciated the lack of fuss in the instructions, or at least most of the instructions, and the methods that were similar to my own. This was really quick to put together thanks to them, and probably my favorite thing to sew for this series. It might end up being my favorite pattern too if I switch up the materials. I'm thinking a psychedelic tulip pink print would be fabulous, so maybe that will show up in a future vlog. But that's it for this one, and I hope you really enjoyed this video. If you did, giving it a like and a comment really helps me out, and if you're new to this series, a playlist with all my Sewing Through the Decades videos will be linked in the description box down below. If you'd like to see my 80s and 90s makes for this series, then you can subscribe since they are coming soon, and for behind the scenes videos and monthly updates, please consider checking out my Patreon, also linked down below, since that funds this entire series and this channel. Thanks for watching, and I shall talk to all of you very soon.